Okay, this is part two of the week four materials for building scalable distributed systems. And in this part, we're going to talk about remote method invocation mechanisms, or as they're often called, remote procedure calls. It's perfectly feasible to write distributed applications using APIs that interact directly with transport layer protocols like TCP or UDP. If we use TCP, for example, we would use the TCP socket library and we can create a connection known as a socket between a client and a server and exchange data over that connection. The socket is basically a pipe between the client and server. Once the socket is created, the client sends data to the server as a message over a stream. In our bank example, the client might request a balance for their checking account, ignoring all language specific issues and security, of course, the client might send a message payload as shown on the slide here with balance and the account number. In the server, we need to know that the first string in this message is the operation identifier, i.e. get the bank balance. And based on this being balance, the second is the bank account number that we want to retrieve the balance for. The server then uses these values to presumably query a database, retrieve the balance and send back the results, perhaps as a message formatted as shown on the slide here with the balance, the bank account number, sorry, and the balance. What we're starting to define here is a very simple message based protocol that the client and the server can adhere to and agree upon to satisfy the requests. In any real complex system, though, the server will support many operations. In a mybank.com example, we might have, for example, login in login service requests, transfers, address changes, statement requests, transactions, and so on. Each will be followed by a different message payload that the server needs to interpret correctly to fulfill the client's request. What we're really defining here is an application-specific protocol. As long as we send the necessary values in the correct order for each operation, the server will respond correctly. If we have an erroneous client that doesn't adhere to the application protocol, well, let's just say our server needs to do really solid error checking. Okay, let's think a little bit more carefully about this application specific protocol that we're starting to define. And step back and think if we were defining our mybank.com server in an object oriented languages such as Java shown on the slide here, we would have each operation that the server offers as a method in an interface. And each operation would be passed the necessary arguments that the server needs to satisfy the request. So you're very used to doing this as you design Java systems. And of course, there are several advantages of having such an interface. First, calls from the client to the server can be statically checked by the compiler to ensure they are of the correct type. This simplifies the, the error checking on the server. Changes in the server interface, such as adding a new parameter, force changes in the client code to adhere to the new method signature. Hence, the, the client must make a call to the correct signature. And the interface is clearly defined by the class definition, or well, the interface definition, and hence straightforward for a client programmer to utilize. These benefits of an explicit interface are, of course, well known in sequential programming. The whole discipline of OO design is pretty much based upon these foundations. Compared to the implicit application protocol, we would need to program with sockets. The advantages are really, really significant. Luckily, these, these advantages were recognized reasonably early in the evolution of distributed systems. And as you can see, since the early 1990s, we've had a set of technologies known collectively as remote method invocation or remote procedure calls that we can use to make uh, calls across a network that look very much as though we're calling a local interface or a local object. So we can see in, in the table here, we have the, the distributed computing environment, which was a mostly C and C++ based technology that came out in the early 90s. An object-oriented version of DCE called Corba came out in a similar time frame a little later in the 90s and was very prominent in that, that time frame. 
Uh, Java's remote method invocation came out in the later 90s as Java became more popular. And in the early 2000s, something called XML Web Services was widely adopted uh, based on a set of specifications known as WSDL and a transport uh, message format known as SOAP. So while the syntax and semantics of these RPC slash RMI technologies varies, the essence of how each operates is really exactly the same. So let's continue with our Java example and use, use this to elaborate on a Java RMI example. So we can trivially make our interface from the previous slide into a, a Java RMI server, as you can see on the slide here. The empty java.rmi.remote interface serves as a marker to inform the Java compiler that we're creating an RMI server. In addition, each method must throw a remote exception. Uh, these exceptions represent errors that can occur when a distributed call between two objects is invoked over a network. The most common reason for one of these exceptions being thrown would be a communications failure or the server object not being available due to a server crash. Once we've defined our remote interface, we then must provide a class that implements this interface. And you can see a simple version of this on the slide. The points to note are the server extends a unicast remote object class. This essentially provides the functionality to instantiate remotely callable objects, i.e. the server can be, be called across the network. Once the server is constructed, its availability must be advertised to remote clients. This is achieved by storing a reference to the object in an RMI registry and associating a logical name with it. In this example, it's my bank server. The registry is a simple directory service that enables clients to look up the location, the location being the network address and the object reference, and obtain a reference or a pointer to a remote RMI server. Once we've started the server from the previous slide, it will advertise its location in the um, RMI registry. We can then create a client to connect to that. And an extract from the client code is shown on the slide here. It obtains a reference to a bank server object from the RMI registry using this lookup command. The reference returned by the lookup operation can then be used to call the server object in the same manner as a local object. Here we see we call bank server dot balance. It looks just like a local um, object call. However, of course, there's a difference. The client must be ready to catch remote exception, which will be thrown by the Java runtime if the server object cannot be successfully reached. This slide depicts the call sequence amongst the components that comprise an RMI system. Note we have two additional objects here, one called a stub in the client and one called a skeleton in the server. These are compiler generated objects that facilitate the remote communications in an RMI system. The skeleton is a TCP network endpoint uh, executing on a host and listening on a particular port and it listens for calls to its associated server objects. In this case, it's our good old MyBank server. When the server reference is stored on startup in the RMI registry, the entry actually contains the client stub that can be used to make remote calls to the server. When the client queries the registry in step two here, the stub for, for the server is what is actually returned. And this stub can then be used to make calls to the server. So here the, the client uses the stub to make a call to the server interface. The stub's job is to transform the call into a format which is amenable to passing across the network. Uh, this is called marshalling of the request. So the, the request is then marshaled across the network to the skeleton, which receives the request, 
recognizes it as a call for the MyBank server, and it then goes through a process of unmarshalling the network packet data into a valid call to the server objects, the Java server objects here. The skeleton then waits for the response from the server object. So this is the response from the method that is called. And then it marshals the results back across the network in a network packet to the stub, which unmarshals the network packet data into the return values expected by the client. So the RMI example on the previous slides illustrates the basics that are used for implementing any RPC or RMI system, even in modern languages such as Erlang and Go. Regardless of the implementation, the basic attraction of these approaches is that they provide an abstract mechanism and location transparency for clients making remote server calls. RPC and RMI approaches are not without flaws. Marshalling and unmarshalling can become inefficient for complex large objects. Cross-language marshalling, where the client is written in one language and the server in another, can cause problems due to types being represented differently in different languages, causing subtle incompatibilities. And if a remote method signature changes, all clients need to obtain a new compatible stub, which can be cumbersome in large deployments. For these reasons, most modern systems are built around simpler protocols based on HTTP or WebSockets and use JSON for parameter representation. Instead of operation names, HTTP verbs such as put, get, post, delete, etc. have associated semantics that are mapped to specific URLs. This approach originated in the work of Roy Fielding in his thesis on the REST approach. REST formally defined has a set of semantics that comprise a RESTful architectural style. And in reality, most systems don't adhere to this full set of semantics. Uh, we'll discuss the basics of HTTP APIs in a later section. But the simplicity afforded by HTTP APIs and their efficiency and scalability make them highly attractive solutions. So we're going to continue in the next section by looking at a set of distributed systems issues to do with the sorts of failures that a system can experience and the thorny issues of distributed coordination and time.